with each other and to react and respond to the presentation, we just ask to please remember to be kind and courteous. We'd also like to thank the Jewish Book Council for partnering with us on this event. The Jewish Book Council is a nonprofit that aims to enrich, educate, and strengthen community through Jewish literature. Each year, JBC reaches more than half a million readers with weekly reviews and essays, arranges 1,400 Jewish literary programs, publishes the literary journal Paper Brigade, presents the National Jewish Book Awards, and provides discussion resources to over 2,000 book clubs, among other activities. I hope you'll visit their website at jewishbookcouncil.org to learn more about all their programs and resources. Now for our guests. Melissa Broder is the author of the novels Milk Fed and the Pisces, the essay collection So Sad Today, and five poetry collections, including Super Doom. She has written for the New York Times, L.com, and New York Magazine's The Cut. She lives in Los Angeles. Kara Price is a creative producer living in New York City. She co-founded Bellatrist Book Club with actress Emma Roberts, along with Bellatrist Productions, a TV and film production company. Welcome to you both. Welcome to us both. What's up? Yeah, you got to go on mute. Hi. I feel like we're just like zooming each other. Well, it's, we are zooming each other. This is weird that people are, whatever, it's cool. I know that I'm we can't see anyone. Charlie Kaufman on this. Although I had this thought, so we're here to talk about Death Valley, which this is the, this is the galley for, no, oh, there you are. Oh, I'm spotlighted now. Um, it occurred to me when I was thinking about this book today that this is um, 127 hours by way of Charlie Kaufman. Interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. I, you know what? I haven't seen it. 127 hours is the one with James Franco where his arm, he has, I think he has to cut off his arm. It's very dark. Um, you want to read- Do they get lost? Do they get lost in the wilderness? He, it's a very solo journey. Okay, he gets lost in the wilderness. Very much so. And there's this very harrowing scene where he's like in between two crap. It's this, I guess this is the Jewish version of it. Definitely, right. He has to he has to saw off a, uh, a jar of gefilte fish. <laughs> exactly. Um, do you want to read first? And then we'll get to talk in. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to read, well, since the Jewish Book Council is here, I'm going to read like a more Jewy. This isn't like a super, this isn't like a very Jewy book. Like, it's just not. Like, it's not milk fed, as no. we know. No, but um, but Kara really likes when I do the voice of my mother, who's Philadelphian. And so um, this mother in the book is a Los Angeles native. But I'm going to read this chapter just because of Kara. And I'll do it as my Philadelphian mother <clears throat> when I, I do the voice. Um, OK, anything that you need to know, um, this character, uh, this unnamed narrator who is speaking is a woman. She's about 41. She um, her father was in a car accident that put him in the ICU. Um, but it's a funny book or I mean, I hope so. And, um, and she, he's in and out of consciousness and she has fled to the nearby desert, uh, halfway between death Valley and the Mojave preserve. I was actually going to call this book in the Valley of death Valley. Um, and my husband was like, just call it death Valley. And like, I was also going to call the, with the Pisces, I was going to call it Pisces rise, Pisces rising. And, she, and he was like, just call it the Pisces. So um, anyway, so this is in the Valley of Death Valley, um, and she has fled to the desert, to a desert town, um, and she is at the Best Western Motel. And I think that's all you need to know. All right. This is chapter six for those following along. I wake up at noon and I'm ready to go back to sleep. When I'm not visiting my father, all I want to do is sleep. I've always loved a nap, depression but now I have full-on performance anxiety about staying awake. No matter what I'm doing, a voice inside me is saying, but you could be sleeping. Why not sleep instead? My answer to the voice is, I am afraid that I will become nothing. When interviewed about my writing process, I always say that I don't believe a person has to suffer to make art, but that's only because I imagine it's true for others. Also, I don't want to be accused of inspiring teen suicide. If ever I attempt to make the inside of my skull a softer place to live, i.e. by saying kind and gentle words, a counter alert pops up inside my head and says, this is dangerous, do not tread here. Also, you're wrong. The counter alert comes from a primal place rooted in my survival instinct. Its message may ultimately be more destructive than helpful, but it feels like protection. Self-preservation through self-flagellation. It's as though I'm wired to believe that if I say something nice to myself, 
cut myself any slack. It will lead to me dying. My husband is gentle with me. The counter voice to the counter alert. You're going through a lot. You need to let yourself rest. Just let yourself rest, he says. But how can I trust him? Of course he wants me to rest, to sleep all day. Don't we all want people to be like us? If we are both sleeping all the time, side by side, my husband and me, then his own depletion seems more normal to him. Oh, her husband's disabled. I don't know if I mentioned that. All I want, he says, is for you to let go of your fears and worries, your self-criticism, and just relax for five minutes. I fear we will both be sucked into the chasm of his illness, trapped there, sharing one pair of footy pajamas, no toehold, nobody to give us a leg up. I fear that I will follow him there, only to regret having followed him. Suffocation, disintegration, a dying but no death. As I fear that I cannot follow my father, who I want to follow, where he is going. Still, the urge to sleep all day is becoming harder to fight. Most days, I end up in a sort of no man's land, the internet, where I click and scroll for hours, not writing, but not sleeping. Propelled by intermittent bursts of dopamine that punctuate my haze, I live an internet life, one that feels like moving forward, but mostly amounts to its own kind of nothing. Sometimes I wonder if I'm genuinely the introvert I think I am, or if it's just that my internet addiction has become a substitute for needing people. Without the internet, I might be a very social person. My third novel, the one that I am here to work on, is the story of a marriage, kind of like my marriage. The husband has a mystery illness. The doctors can't fix him. The wife is dealing with emotional fatigue, exacerbated by people asking questions for which she has no answers and prescribing podcasty cures like he needs to cut out wheat and other remedies the husband tried already in a long list of ineffective remedies. Rifaximin, acupuncture, dicyclamine, B12 drip, elimination diet, amoxicillin, testosterone, probiotics, Valtrex, turmeric, fish oil, famotidine, biofeedback, Zoloft. Oh, I forgot that. My, this is like a little bit based on some reality. I forgot that my husband tried Zoloft. Prednisone, coffee I mean, enema. That. That's true too. And bowel rest. Unlike my husband and me, the couple are New Yorkers who have been, only been together a few years. They journey to Venice Beach in search of the California dream, which appears in the form of a young man who lives upstairs. A skater and surfer, he owns multiple boards. The young man is everything they are not, healthy, mellow, hot, and they both grow increasingly obsessed with him. In the climax of the novel, the wife is busted stealing from Sephora. She's a skincare fanatic, history of acne, gets in a fight with the husband and runs away with the skater surfer to a music festival in the California desert, where something happens to reveal that the skater surfer is not the sort of golden archangel figure she hoped he was, preferably one who could relieve her of her own humanity, but just another boring human like the rest of us, thus demystifying both the illusion of the California dream and the value of newness, and catalyzing the kind of character transformation I'm told is necessary for a successful novel. In this case, the realization that love is not always a feeling, sometimes it's a verb, and that she loves her husband. I don't know yet what will go down in the desert to trigger the epiphany. I'm less concerned with the inciting incident than I am with a more overarching fear that the book is too earthbound, that I am. Before... My, uh, my, I just remembered my agent, Meredith, shout out to Meredith made, um, there was some more text after that. And she, she made a good cut there before I can further grapple with such questions. I must fortify myself with a little in-room coffee. The window to pick up grab and go is long past the grab and go breakfast is like a major hero in this book, by the way, major big character. Then I call my mother to see if she has any news about my father's condition. Okay. Here comes the mother. I'm worried about the sweatpants, she says. What? The sweatpants. They've been sitting in the house for weeks. Oh. Somewhere between unconsciousness one and unconsciousness three, the father falls unconscious and then wakes up, falls unconscious, wakes up. Um, my mother's Yenta friend told her that if my father was going to go to rehab after the ICU, he would need multiple pairs of sweatpants. I was assigned the job of procuring the sweatpants. Unfortunately, he never made it to rehab. Have you heard anything from the hospital? I ask her. I don't like to bother the nurses, she says. I'll call over in a bit. I think you jumped the gun. What do you mean? The sweatpants. 
You told me to buy them. I know, she says, but I should have trusted my instincts and had you wait. It's like buying a gift for an unborn baby. Somehow, like the mother has now become like Barbara Streisand, the voice, but whatever. The, the fill, I don't know what happened. You don't, you don't do it. I'll do, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna lean into it. I'm gonna go with it. You don't do it. Something might happen to the baby before it's born. So you're saying dad got pneumonia and fell unconscious again because I bought four pairs of sweatpants on Amazon and had them shipped to your house. I'll just feel better if we return them. But he's conscious now. What if by returning them, we please? Fine. I'll email you the return codes. Just go drop them off. You don't even have to box them up. I don't have to box them up. No, no boxing, I say. Who ever heard of such a thing? How are you doing otherwise, I ask her, besides the sweatpants? I'm fine, she says. Why? Whenever I try to emotionally connect with my mother, she acts like I'm crazy to think she has feelings to express. It makes me self-conscious of my own sensitivity, like anything resembling a feeling is dramatic, frivolous, unnecessary. People always say that it's good to feel your feelings, that if you don't feel them now, they'll come out later. But throughout this crisis, I have yet to see hers come out. And who's to say what it means to handle something well? Here I am with a full emotional range, and I'm paralyzed. Meanwhile, my mother is staying very busy with her business, the house. Some days I think she's headed for a fall. Most days, I feel like she's handling this well, and that her lack of an emotional response is proof that something is wrong with me. Oh my God, she says. Oh no. What? What's wrong? I say. Nothing, she says. I just remembered. I have to go to Home Depot and get a hose. The mom became Fran Drescher. What can I say? Maybe she's a native New Yorker. But usually there's just one thing. How do you say your last name in her voice? Well, she's like, Meles. Meles. No, your last name. Your last name. Greater. There you go. Melissa I just want the people to know how talented. Yeah. Breeder. Melissa Breeder. Yeah, there it is. There it is. Melissa Breeder. Long before mayor of Easttown, there was uh, Linda Brody. Linda Brody. Well, I was going to, yeah. I have, to go to him. I have to go to Home Depot and get a hose. There it hose. is. There it is. There hose. Sorry if I uh, stoked your perfectionism a little bit. Um, so as we're here to have a conversation about your book, I did something that I think was, um, I felt very, I felt a lot of love for Nikki, your real husband, when I was reading this book. And sort of in his honor, I thought, well, first of all, I went to go look in the dictionary about what grief how they define grief. And I don't fucking have a dictionary, which I think would disappoint him. So I looked online and um, the first thing that comes up on Merriam-Webster is the definition of grief is a deep and poignant distress caused by, or as if by bereavement. And um, I guess my first question for you because I know you very well. And because it's, I guess, something that I want to hear you answer is like, what was, I mean, this, what was this book caused by essentially? Cause this is like a grief novel and, and, and what was the cause of this book? And, you know, it's, I don't think it was a book that you would have written otherwise. So my own father, as you know, was in a car accident in 20 in well, I don't know if the audience knows. Um, I, I really do feel like I'm just talking to Kara. Um, so my own father was um, in a car accident in December of 2020, and um, he was put in the ICU for six months before he died. And um, it was during COVID. So we weren't able to go see him for the first couple of months. And he was in and out of consciousness. Um, and my sister lives in Las Vegas. Um, and I was trying, I was feeling anticipatory grief. Um, I didn't know what, what that was. Um, and I was just afraid that my usual levels of depression and anxiety had like spawned new babies and something very bad was happening um, because I was feeling something, you know, and, and that gives me cause for alarm. So um, I was driving. Um, I So I was trying to escape this feeling and I was driving back and forth through the desert to my sisters um, in Vegas um, because we weren't allowed to go in to see him. So I wanted to be close to family. And um, I, uh, the first line of the book came to me. I was driving through Baker, California, which is home of the world's largest thermometer. First line of the book came to me. And I suddenly had this idea that of a woman who could go inside, um, a magic cactus and encounter different loved ones of hers at different stages of their lives. 
Um, that was the genesis. Um, and then a couple of months later, I went and did a desert recon trip, um, with my, with my husband. And, um, I, uh, went hiking, um, in this very touristy area where no one gets lost called Zabriskie point. Um, it's, I, it wasn't even a hike. I was walking and taking notes on my phone, like by the tourists. Well, so I got insanely lost. Um, I was crying. I, I only had Coke zero with me, which is like, it's just a really dumb move. Like who goes into death Valley with no, whatever. So, um, I ended up climbing up this rock face. Um, I panicked, which you're not supposed to do. I was like, how long have I been out here? It had been like, you know, 30 minutes, but, um, but it was over for me. Um, I panicked and got all scraped up climbing up this rock face. And when I got back to my car, found my way back, got back to my car. And when I started, when I, when I stopped crying, um, and after I texted Kara pictures of my very butch in your defense, uh, well, in, yeah. in your defense, it was as the kids say on your gnarly, it was gnarly. It was, it was gnarly. gnarly. Maybe I'll, and I, I, know. And I know this is co-hosted by the Jewish book council. The wounds are normally inside here. You really got physical wounds from the writing process. Sure did. Yeah. Sure it was did. I tried to suffer from my art, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. But sorry, I interrupted you. Oh, no, no. The last thing I was going to say is I got back to my car and I was like, okay, now I know what has to happen in this novel. Like, and so, so the sort of grief narrative and, um, cactus narrative then becomes a desert survival story and she gets lost for more than like 30 minutes in the book yeah 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 yes, but if yeah. You know, I, I feel like you got lost wasn't there I any mean, question? you didn't tell Nikki in the real story not to do this whole thing that people know I love it but in the real story you did not tell Nikki that you were going and so that was a big part oh. of it he was sleeping right I went my phone didn't have service. Like I was taking notes on my simple note app. I only had Coke zero and the sun was coming up and it was blazing hot. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't really, it was over. Yeah. 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 Until it was. And so, and thus this novel, I, so I gotta be honest, like this, I was, I, I read this novel a long time ago when I first got it. And I knew then, then when you said, we were going to do this. Then I was like, I'm not going to talk to you about the novel. Cause as I, to- it, 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 it's a kind of hurrah as you talk about in the novel. Um, because I wanted to be able to talk to you about it for the first time live. So it could be erotic. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's very hard for me to express. It, it's like, you know, I would imagine it's like how other monks feel about reading Tik Nok Tan, where it's like, I just, it's like, it's not only just reading my own diary. I just, I feel like I'm reading, um, I just feel like I'm reading a guide, a guidebook that both identifies, you know, my own way in the world and also is a, is an actual guidebook. And I think one of the reasons that there is such a fan base for Melissa Broder, the writer, is that your books are deeply funny and they're fiction, but I think people get a lot of shit out of your books. And I think that as a writer, you probably don't, maybe you do think about that a lot. I don't know, but um, I think they're also guidebooks. And um, so in and of itself, like there is a, there is empathy. You, you, it's a, you're practicing empathy by writing, right? Even though your, your sort of protagonist sees herself as very selfish and self-absorbed. Um, so I just wanted to say that, and I, I do think you're a neurotic pioneer as you write in your book. Um, and I guess my next question, because it's, it is sort of a central conceit, or it's something that you and the, your husband, the, or that the, the writer character and her husband talk about a lot in the novel, which is like this difference between empathy and compassion. And um, I'm curious, like Melissa, the, the novelist, sort of where you net out on the two definitions and if they are different. I mean, they are different, right? There's two different words. They are different. You know, so yes, in this book, Death Valley, <clears throat> um, the uh, the the husband and wife character, um, the protagonist and her husband, um, they get into a fight about um, plant care that is not really a fight about plant care, right? It never is. Never and, is. Uh, it never is. Um, and basically, um, you know, she wants to throw away this plant and, um, and he, I think probably sees it as a bit, 
uh, more than a plant and, and, you know, and her reasons for wanting to throw away the plant, right, are perhaps not sitting well with him. So they get into this fight about empathy versus compassion because she says to him, how do you know what this plant feels? Um, Because the plant's name is Dante and um, the husband is like, you know, like, how do you think Dante would feel about that? And she's like, how do you know how, like, what do you, how do you presume to know what Dante feels? And he says, you know, um, I don't need to know how he feels. I have compassion, which is different than empathy, although he actually mixes them up at first. So he thinks, but so empathy, I've still yet to like a hundred percent nail this down, but, but as far as I know, empathy is when we can, um, it's when we've either experienced the same thing as someone else, or we can at least, um, feel what they are feeling, right? Put ourselves in their shoes, right? Whereas compassion is we don't have to put ourselves in their shoes. We don't have to understand what they are feeling to have sympathy, right? And so in the novel, the husband is saying that compassion is the more um, sort of, I almost use the word elevated, which is horrifying, Um, but it's the more, um, the nobler of the two, right? Um, You know, compassion, it's elevated, it's elevated empathy. But so, um, right, he's saying compassion is the nobler of the two, but compassion, that's a really hard thing as defined as that. That's a hard thing as a human being to achieve, to not be able to really like put ourselves in someone's shoes, to not necessarily like even need to feel remotely what they're feeling and to not have experienced something or personalize it in order to um, have sympathy. That's a much harder thing than empathy. And I think, um, you know, when the self-centered protagonist um, gets lost in this desert, which is also, I think, could be seen as the desert of grief. But when she gets lost in this desert, she starts to experience things that her father, um, who is on life support and on a feeding tube and in and out of consciousness, uh, she starts to experience profound thirst, right? And so now, instead of, she was taking everything that her father, like if he didn't want to see her, right? In his profound thirst, she was like, does he not, he doesn't, he doesn't love me, you know? And and sort of projecting all of her shit on it, which is a hard thing when like, you know, but now she's like, oh my God, like when you're dying of thirst, like you're just trying to stay alive. Like he's just trying to stay alive, you know? And I'm like sitting there asking him these like these questions. Um, and it's not that he's telling me to like, go relax, which is, I'd say like some of my father's greatest words of probably ones I really need to, my own father said, go relax. Um, but that was what he said to get rid of me, you know? And, um, like to not, she's sort of, she begins to empathize in some way, but again, it's, you know, it's, feeling what he was feeling, right? Like she's not able to kind of come to that. She can maybe come to it intellectually, like that everyone has to die in their own way, blah, blah. But on an emotional level, that is hard. Yeah. Well, it, as you write in the book, to not make another person's coma about you is very, it's, I think we all have trouble with that. Um, but that was a very, that was a very good answer, actually. That's very Thanks. clear to me. Even if it's not true, even if it's not true, yeah. It's, I mean, it does. See, I, I, I think compa- compassion has. Le- there's less dopamine though in compassion. I think. Y- interesting. So maybe that's why it's more challenging. Because yeah, it's, it's it's like compassion is like pa- is compassion is like. Uh, this doesn't have to do with me, but like I can see why this would upset you. Right. You know. But and, and, and like, it's like even this if happened to me. This happened to me. I understand. What this Everything feels- becomes so much more important when we can identify. Right, right. Right, like the causes we champion are often near and dear to us. Yeah. Well, it's it's interesting. I mean, but I also think empathy is a little bit of a joke. Like I, 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 I tell you, I do, I remember exactly where I was when you texted me that your dad got in an accident and you were, because my dad also got in an accident, but he died immediately. We're very different. Um, the, no, I'm joking. I'm I was I, I mean, it's true. He, I mean, you only have empathy for the accident. But I was making, I was making a joke in the sense of like, um, I preempted my joke, which is to say that the minute you said it to me, I think I might have even texted you, but maybe I didn't to say like, it's much harder to deal with the living. You know what I mean? Like in and and the point is, is it's like it's not. There's no hierarchy of like dads and car accidents. Um, as much as like our comedic brains would like to, you know, sort of think there is. Um, but I do think that like, 
it does change. I, I, I would imagine for you, but well, I guess what I was thinking is, would it change for Melissa to have, because you'd, you've always, my dad died a long time ago. You've always known that my dad died. This thing happens to you. I don't really think like it immerses you like in a certain way, I think it would contribute and maybe I'm splitting hairs now, but I think it would contribute to your compassion for me as a person, not necessarily, necessarily your empathy, just because I do think that like experiencing something, I think puts us more in touch with our own humanity and therefore contributes to our capacity for compassion, not empathy. I don't know. I think there is something very selfish about empathy and I agree in a certain way. And I actually think that like the more things happen to us, the more like the deeper our capacity for compassion becomes less than empathy. Like, oh, I, you, you and I talk about this all the time, which is like, you know, every day is another day that I become the person that I roll my eyes at, you know what I mean? Like in that, in got a it, you got way, it. Exactly. So I don't know. It is very, I, you made me think a lot about this and I will move on because I want to talk about, um, and no, my relationship to you having a before go my relationship to you having a father who died. Also, my husband's father died when my husband was five. And I was mm. like, you know, and I do, I, I, I do. I'm not like, that's not, I wasn't like, that's not sad. You know, I wasn't just like, like the death. Yeah. But, understood it on a whole different level when I lost a parent, you know, and in this particular way, I think where, yeah. And so, um, before that it was more of a story and, you know, I'm kind of ashamed to say that, but, but this is, I think the truth of the human brain. Yeah. Yeah. I guess what I mean also is that, um, like the process of being intimate with another person who has gone through something that you go through can also change your, your own experience of going through it. Like I, you know, it's like to see how somebody else deals with something is like, Oh, interesting. Like there are some blind spots for me, you know, I, that, so that, and that, uh, you know, in sort of watching your personal journey with this, not just in the novel, but, um, has, you know, sort of, I guess made me empathize. Eh, there you go. Um, I wanted maybe to have ask, more compassion for yourself. There you go. Um, I wanted, there's so much, I mean, to, I have, I have a whole thing here, but I did want to, there, there's a few more serious things I want to talk or more booky things. And then I want to talk about more like Brodarian, you know, weirdness, um, that I put in this section called the grave. Um, but I, I want you to talk a little bit about this because I think like when you were reading just now and you were talking about how we want other people to be like us, I started thinking about the way that you and I talk about um, like the language that we have developed over time for talking about the way we think. Yes. And there is something very seductive about that. You know, like there's like, um, and because relating to other people is very seductive and to have people going through what you're going through is very seductive. And so like, there are things that I then read that are in your books and this happened with Pisces. It, it just can, it continuously happens. Happened with Pisces, happened with MilkFed. And it really happened with this book, which is like, there's a way that you speak about your own thinking that is incredibly familiar to me. And, and, one, and, and one of the most kind of familiar things that you say in this, you know, is, is on, um, and I don't know if anybody, I, whoever has the book can go to this, but like this idea on page 99 that you, you know, put forward, um, of like, you know, my arrival at a place of non-arrival were like so many answers and arrivals only provisional. And, you know, and, and I think it's a, it's an elaboration on the early, the Kierkegaard quote, which yes, I did text you. Um, also want to carry, you want to read that? The Kierkegaard? Yes. Yeah, so, okay. And on the first page of the novel, are you on page one? Is it the page one? Yes, yeah. Page one. page one. So on page one of the novel, the narrator is talking about driving to the desert, trying to escape a feeling. And she says a friend texted her a quote earlier that day by Kierkegaard, which normally she would just like heart it and be like, oh, ha, ha you know, or whatever. But she is in such distress that she ends up using it to try to meditate on, on the toilet in the, on the toilet, on the, to on, that was very Philadelphia of me on the, 
on the toilet, um, <laughs> on the toilet of a, um, at the Circle K in the public bathroom. Anyway, so so Kara had texted me this quote, literally. What's the quote, Kara? Which is, sorry, I was taking a, a drink. Um, the, if, uh, fuck, where is, where are we now? God, I really, sh- third part that landing. I was on 99, I'm so sorry. Page one, uh, earlier today, a friend. Is- oh, sorry. I'll, I'll, earlier I'll today, wait. a friend texted me a quote by Kierkegaard. Life is not a problem to be solved, but a reality to be experienced. Best wishes trying to do that. And then we go to 99, which is the place of non-arrival. We're like so many answers and arrivals only provisional, which is this idea of like, we want, I mean, I don't know. You talk about it. It's your, you talk right. about it. All right. So in this, all right. So there's a lot about there's a lot of God in this book or a lot of, right. There's a lot of, there's a lot of the big G, the big, or the, no, I usually lowercase G actually. Um, there's a lot of the lowercase G in this book. And um, at this point in the novel, the character says that she was first in her kind of life. Well, she, in her, in her looking for God, right. Like in her trying to nail God down, um, not to the cross, but just to nail God down. Um, she, really wanted to know what her God was. So was it the Jewish God she grew up with? I don't even know if she says that, but she basically just wanted a brand name God so she could know where to find it in a pinch. And then she sort of came to the idea and made peace with the idea that um, God is unknowable and there's no need for an answer because there's nothing missing, she says. And if I could concept, so basically she, she kind of becomes resolved to not knowing. And then she achieves like a sort of, certitude about like not that there's no god she believes in god but she's like it's okay that i don't know right so she arrives at whatever i don't remember what Kara the part that Kara read but um oh she said there was she thought she had gotten to the spiritual end point right that she is okay with not knowing she's like i'm done i'm good i'm okay with not knowing this is what my higher power this is what god is and blah 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 and then now she's like she says this she's like i liked how i sounded i thought i had it settled Settled with the unsettled, I was spiritually smug. But I guess there is no spiritual endpoint, no final graduation, at least amongst the living. Every door can be a trap door, every bottom a trap bottom. And my professed peace with not knowing my answer, with not knowing my answer that no one has the answer, my arrival at a place of non-arrival were, like so many answers and arrivals, only provisional. It's annoying. No, no. I wasn't going to oh, say it's annoying that there that we don't get to stay. You, I mean, you always say this. It's like, I want to be done. I want to be done, but I don't want to be dead, which is the theme of your book. You know, it's like, and I, and, and that's what's amazing as I'm talking to you about it. It's like, there is, that is really the thesis as, as this character like meditates on death and grief. It's like, and, and that's why it's like depression aside, it's like, you as a person and also the character in this book, like very much wants to be alive. You know, I I mean, that's my interpretation, no pressure, but I'm just saying like, I think the thing is, and and I, I really wept reading this earlier again is like, you know, and, and, and because everything is so repetitive in an OCD mind, but also in the world, um, I do think that like the final, you know, belt, tolling of this thesis happens at the very end of the book on you know page 227 in my book which is and this guy this kills me what's so frightening about what's so frightening about existing it keeps going and also it will end if i could define my terror of life and dying and loving and all of it if i could say this is what it is i would say it keeps going it keeps going and also it will end and it's just like, I mean, you know, it's, it, I think our people are a Talmudic people. It comes out differently um, because you wear a chain, you know, and, and not a, a talus, but it's like, I, I think this is philosophy, man. Sorry. I just had a moment, you know? Thanks, boo. Um, I consider myself a uh, 21st century. What century are we in? 21st century. Yeah. 
some flaws. Okay, here's here's something I want to say that, and I see that we have some questions from the audience, but yeah, I wanted to see the question. Yeah. I wanted to address Kara's. Um, so there's a sort of meta, meta, meta thing happening here, which is that the character, because we talked, we just were talking about wanting to be done. The character in the book talks about, because she's an author, the protagonist is an author. Um, and she talks about this feeling of, I guess a fraudulence of sorts is the only way I could, because her characters all come to an arc, right? They all have an arc and then it all comes to an end. Now, this character's books, I don't think her, her endings are neat. You know what I'm saying? She's not like a summy uppy happily ever after kind of writer, but her characters arrive and then they vanish on the last page. They arrive, even if it's just an internal arrival, right? They get after the revelation, they, they disappear. That's it. Poof. Meanwhile, the writer still has to go on and there can be a feeling of fraudulence when someone's characters, um, come to a place of peace or understanding with something and you're still in the desert as the writer you know it's like and i had so so in in the meta the meta part is i think that to some extent um you know this character is probably only beginning her journey with grief her father well i won't spoil her but i, I think that whether he dies or not, I won't, I won't spoil it, but you know, like she's probably just beginning her journey, but at the, but whatever, that's all I'll say. But I, so as a writer though, as the writer of this book, I think it's been really, really hard for me to like two and a half years after my father died. And for that, and for other reasons, chemical, uh, uh, nature, nurture, um, proclivity, and like life events, my father's death and some other passings that I've experienced in the past couple of years, um, you know, to be like, shit, dude, like, am I, that's a literary, that's another one of my feels, but shit, dude, to be, to feel like you're not where you should be, you know, where you're not like, you're like, oh, you're not where you're supposed to be emotionally with a, and like Karen knows, I think I was giving myself sh shit for the grieving process of my father within like two weeks, you know, after he died. Cause I was like, I was like, well, let's move on. And like, you know, I was already Googling complex grief, but you know, day three of COVID I was Googling long, long COVID. So, you know, it's whatever. Anyway. No, it reminds me. I, I, this, there was another question. I had a million questions. I'm not going to ask any of them because we have to, I want other people to ask, but we'll ask, do you want to ask one more and then we'll do the audience question? I will. I was going to mention, well, I'm not going to ask this one, but I was going to say, I think one of the themes in here and the, the husband character really kind of interrogates is like, what is this obsession with the validation for like the validation of suffering? You know, like, and I relate to it and, uh, you know, some people attribute it to like gender. I, I don't know, but like, I think to a certain extent, or a lot of people can relate to this idea of like, is it okay that, is it okay that, am I okay? I mean, that's why I read it, pop the fuck off. Like that could be a whole, I love Reddit in this novel. Like, is it okay that I'm sad right now that this is how, you know? Um, and it's so weird. Cause we like, really, I, we really talk to a lot of people and identify and have a lot of friends and like, I find that the, you know, there isn't a lot of, I don't feel comfortable asking for that validation. And so it lives in here and then it fucks me up. Right. And by validation, I think what you mean, or I think like, is this, is this too much, you know, yeah. like, is this grief too much? Is it going to be okay? When will it end? You know, yeah. like, when will it end? Will I be okay? Which only prolongs the, which only well, it's like the, actually it was, um, Claire by Watkins, um, did a really beautiful review of the book in the New York times. And I was so happy to see that she talked, it, it was like very weird to see that she talked about the, the Buddhist double arrow of suffering, right? So there is like the one arrow that we are wounded with. So that can be the event that causes the suffering, the sadness or the feeling or the, the suffering itself, right? The, the pain itself, let's say. And then there is the second arrow we sling into ourselves, which is the, is it, is it bad that I'm st still feeling, you know, it, that, that sort of, and, um, 
it was funny because like, I didn't even, I mean, it, it's all over this book, you know, the character giving herself shit for her feelings, but I like forgot that she was doing that. And I'm like, Oh, that's really prescient in my own life right now. How, you know, but I guess I did write this book. So, um, why wouldn't it have been prescient then too? And then you have the double arrow, the cognitive double arrow too. I guess it's the same thing. What's the difference? Yeah. Um, well then, right. Then there's, a, then there's the third arrow. So it's like the arrow of, um, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be torturing myself over like, I, yeah, right. There's like the pain and then the suffering. And then the third arrow of, I shouldn't, why am I causing myself this suffering? I know what I'm doing, but I'm still doing it. And I mean, there can be a whole, you know, a whole, what, what is the thing of arrows called? A cod? I don't know. Oh, that like what you would do with archery. Yeah. Like we're like, you can be like a, I mean, you can have like eight I arrows. Scientific, I think they call it a nut sack of arrows. A nut sack of arrows? Yeah, that's it. It's like a pride of lions, a nut sack of arrows. Um, I know mean, that is. No, I'm kidding. I, I, <laughs> it just felt like a pat. Very um, the last thing I want to ask you, and then I'm going to ask these questions that people have. I want you, I, this is so, I, this is very classic. Well, one, is there a National Cactus Defense League? Nay, not as far as I know. And there is no cottontail organization? No. Well, I'm sure there are, but it's not run by the rabbits. In this book, the rabbits, you know, right. It, it, I'm sure there are many, actually. There probably are a lot of cactus, cacti leaves, but no, there, as far as I know, there is no NDL and there's no rabbit and there's no rabbit organization run by the rabbits. Right. Talk for a, a minute about the pea cannon and your bone to pick with it, because I thought that was genius. All right. So. I just always feel like there's not enough like peeing and pooping in literature. It's like, here's the thing, like people, we are all always peeing and pooping. Like it is a, it's a universality, right? There, there's, there are many, I believe feelings are universal. Um, but you know, but a lot of like our activity, our life experiences are not universal, right? Like there are, there are many life experiences that, um, you know, and then hence empathy and compassion come up. But, um, so, but, so, but, but peeing and pooping, extremely universal, perhaps the most universal besides eating and sleeping. And um, yeah, so so the protagonist talks about the fact that like, you know, her she had an editor say to her like, pee is not a plot point. And she's like, I beg to differ. So there's like, you know, and when you're in the wilderness, peeing and pooping, you know, it's like a, it's a big thing. So um, one book, I'm trying to think of, um, there are a number, I can name a couple of books um, that have that have pee and poop on the top, off the top of my head. I'm looking at my shelf right now and I can't remember the name of it, but it was a book that came out like, two years ago from Hogarth that started on a toilet. And I was like, yes. And I, I, the name is totally, um, oh, it'll come to me. But anyway. No, I, I, I never thought about it before because it's like- The Life of the Mind. The Life of the Mind. The Life of the Mind. Starts on a toilet. Great book. It is, but it's like, because it's a novel, it's like here, it's like, if people only saw us here in life, they would be like, they never pee. Because they don't see, you know, what? it's like a- all right. I want to pray for character development too. Not that everyone pees differently, but I think we all have slightly different approaches and wiping. Well, I mean, that's a whole wiping is a whole, you know, it's a whole character. Nobody stuff. wipes. That's the other thing. Nobody wipes. Sometimes people wipe in movies. Wiping is a very like sad girl. Like I've seen, you know, it's like, I've seen Sarah Jessica Parker wipe. Yeah. Okay. She's thinking. On sex in the city. She wipes. Yeah. Cause it's a moment. It's like pensive. Right. Um, all right. I want to ask the first question. Oh, I think you'll like this. But what do I know? What role does fantasy play in your work? It seems to play a big role. <laughs> it appears. Yeah. Um, I like fan. I like to read books like my favorite books. I like books that have fantasy that's grounded in reality. So I don't always love when like there's a fully made up world. Like, I don't think I read like genre fantasy mm. My, my poem with, fan, with, with like pure genre fantasy or speculative fiction. It, it always feels so made up to me, which it is, but um, I'm always just like, how did you decide on these rules? Whereas, um, cause there do have to be rules of a world. Right. And I had a poetry teacher who said, um, you know, you can do anything in a poem, but you have to first teach the reader how to live in it. And so with death Valley, Death Valley is very grounded in reality until it's not. But everything that appears, I made sure I was like anything that is 
is a fantastical element one, you know, or an archetypal element um, has to be introduced early on, right? Chekhov's archetypal element, Chekhov's fantasy. So like if something came in later, I would weave it back in and, and milk fed um, when I wrote the first couple drafts, there's a, there's a golem and there are, there is a rabbi who, um, a, a, an imaginary rabbi, uh, that only Rachel can see, um, that play like very integral roles in the book. But in my first many, many drafts of that book, um, there was no rabbi, there was no golem. And I think that they're my favorite characters in the book, but so it was like, they came in later and with the Pisces, um, the merman was born to me like right away with the beginning with with the book. Same with like this magic cactus in this book, you know, like it was like no book without the cactus, no Pisces without Theo. Milkfed, I think it's like shitty book without Rabbi and Gollum, but it could have existed. A good answer. So I didn't think about that. There's always sort of this fantastical center of all, your three novels. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of Milkfed, somebody asked why you made Rachel a comedian. In in milk fed the the um the for a second I just forgot if it was in first person it is it's the narrator um Rachel is a comedian why did you make her a comedian I have no idea I know there was a reason I mean I hope there was a reason like I hope it wasn't just a random choice well I think I knew you know what it was I really wanted to make fun of Hollywood culture and like um so I knew that she was I knew I wanted her to have like a day job working in management. And I think I wanted her to have like a night situation where she was try trying to. So I, I felt like the nightness, I was like, stand up. Like, it's just, but you know what, with Milkfed, I was, I feel like Milkfed, I, is, it is a funny book. Um, if I do say so myself, but very funny, the comedy parts are like the least funny. And those were like the hardest to write. Like, I think I re wrote, rewrote them like 50 times. I remember did, Rolling Stone said you were like one of the funniest people in America. And I, it's funny because I, 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 I never, which is true. I, I never think of you as a comic, but you are a comic. It's very interesting. Like to me, I don't know that uh, there's, that's not a question, but I, I it's just, yeah. but I don't think in America. I mean, I think maybe like, you know, on my street. No, definitely in America. I mean, you have a way of saying there, there are lines. I mean, even. In this book, there are lines that I was like cackling. Good. And I do. Good. I want that. Um, I want people to, I want it to be, I want it to be a pleasure. It's funny. There's a moment in this book that is so, was so this to me when you talk about, fuck, I can't remember. It was something like you were, the, the, the character was having a terrible time of something. Oh, oh, it was when you were talking about being in the hospital and being swaddled in the hospital or the character was being swaddled in the hospital and you knew you were going to make a joke. The character was going to make a joke about first um, how they ended up in the hospital. Um, yes. Yes. And the cat, well, the character, right. The character has a, a voting related injury, a voting related, um, injury. democracy it's related true. injury, which is yeah. actually a true story. Cause the character, you know, there's, she has a lot of similarities to me, the, the narrator of this novel, more similarities than Rachel or Lucy who had similarities, but yeah. Um, and right. She, so she got in a democracy related injury and, um, broke her tibia. I don't know if she did in the book, but I did. Um, and, um, laying there in the hospital, just like surrendered in like the white shirt. Yes. Oh, you're just like, you know what? I give up, take care of me. Um, and it's fabulous. But yeah, she knew that when the nurse came in, she was going to make a joke that like, she's like, but I still had to be on a little bit. Cause I knew I was going to make a joke that was like, well, I'm never voting again. Because <laughs> yeah. she got in a she she fell in a hole uh when she was or I fell in a hole. Um we both did. Um, you know, last time trying to get the ballot and to the box in time, fell in a hole uh, and sprained an ink or what they thought was a sprain, but was a tibia fracture. Anyway, I so she, I'm, she's gonna say I'm never give I'm never voting again. That you have uh, to make yeah. see, there's one more question. Oh know, how are we going? in what we way, going? in what way in what ways do your sobriety and your writing practice work together? Could you do one with the other? And you talk, this character is also sober in the novel. Yeah, this character is sober. Um, as am I. Um, I think that, well, first of all, I could probably write drunk. You can't edit drunk. And when I drink, I'm always drunk. So, and you need to edit. 
you have to be able to edit your work. You have to be able to look with a cold eye. And alcohol gives you a very warm eye for what you've written. You know, how? oh my God, just like, yeah, alcohol and like weed, you know, like the profundity, right? Like I used to like, I was that person who would be like sitting in the corner of the party, like high, like writing in a journal. And I was like, yes, like the, the mysteries, right? Or like even on mushrooms, like would be like, yes, yes. And then like the next day I'd be like, what the fuck is this? You know? Um, so I think you have to be able to have like a, a cold critical eye. Um, and, and I, yeah, so that, that is certainly one way, um, you know, my sobriety has, um, also you have to be alive in order to write. And I, I don't know that I would still be alive if I were not sober. It's funny. I never think of sobriety as like literal physical sobriety, which is how you just answered the question. Yeah. Um, and it's true. You like, you actually need to be sober to write. I mean, in a way you need to be sober to edit. You're right. In the yeah. sense. I mean, there's, I mean, look, there are some great, I mean, you know, like Hemingway's like who everyone talks, you know, yes, there are some great drunken writers. Um, I myself was not a great drunken writer. Right. Right. Didn't work for me. Yeah. My work for some. Um, I, the writing practice piece of the question, is it linked? Like, cause I guess I'm interested, like you do really have a writing practice. It's not like spontaneous. No, I, yeah, I do. I do. Um, and actually I've been sort of shirking it, but, um, cause I don't know yet sort of some things, but, um, but yeah, I do. And I think that like, um, all right, well, here's one, one way that writing is a lot like sobriety. Um, you know, writing a novel is like a really long haul and maintaining long-term sobriety is a really long haul and everything is done, um, on the day-to-day -day basis, right? Like, so it's, it's putting one foot in front of the other. It's, um, you know, like you, you sit down to work on a very tiny piece of your novel, you know, you, and it's like, and, and you do that day after day after day. And you also wonder, you know, and you wonder like, am I Jack Nicholson in The Shining? Like, cause I had the experience of like writing a book that was like horrible and is like still in a drawer. And I spent like years working on it, you know? And so you just don't know, you really don't know. I didn't know if this book would work. I never know if it's going to, to work, you know? And that's like a big risk. And so I think though, like, but it is day after day after day. And it's like staying in the day, because if you think about the journey, I mean, I make, I make an outline, but if you think about the journey ahead, it's like, how am I going to do that? You know? Yeah. I think that's a very, and also I think it's so hard to combat this sort of the fan, the fantasy of writing a novel, which is why I think a lot of people think they can do it. Yeah. And a very small amount of people can actually do the reality part of writing a novel, which is what I think you do very well. I don't really know how I did it, how I've done it. Um, interesting. Let me uh -huh. ask this question. And I don't know how much time, well. Yeah, does, how much time do we, I think we it's, it's eight of, I, I think I'll ask this last one. Yeah. In the Pisces, was your intention to portray Theo as a metaphor or a real person? Good question. So the way I always define it, the way I always, what I always say about Theo the merman, and Theo was a merman in the Pisces for those who haven't read the Pisces. So um, I um, always say that like we, Lucy, the protagonist, sees Theo, the, how, how clearly do we ever see anyone that we are romantically obsessed with? Lucy is romantically obsessed with Theo. So um, that's really, I think, like for the reader to decide for themselves, right? Um, but I will say, I will end on this little anecdote. Um, recently, somebody on Twitter tweeted me a picture, a photo, tweeted me a photo, and they and it was like some hot bearded actor, and they were like, "This is what I imagine Theo the Merman looks like," mm. and I was like. I always imagined Theo the Merman clean shaven, but when she sent that to me, I was like, oh my God, you're right. Like he, how would he, he wouldn't have a razor. He's in the sea. Like, of course he had a beard. And so I'm like, <laughs> oh, she's right. But the whole, my, uh, my, all these years, I mean, you know, I started writing that book in 2016, I think, or 2017, like Theo has been hairless. So I don't know. That's, 
you know, so it really, I, I, and I love when, when readers like come to me with like these theories about my book, which like on occasion, some books so on occasion, sometimes I'm like, oh, like, no, no, no. But like, for the most part, I'm always like, hmm, that's kind of plausible. Like, like, you know, like when people, if people have written like college papers and stuff, I'm like, I never even thought of that. So that's pretty, yeah. That's always fun. Have people put, there's college papers. Yeah, there's, I mean, a couple of people send me college papers. Cool. Yeah, it's cool. That's just, I was just doing a plot there. Um, that was a good question. That was a good answer. Um, all right. Well, I, I, not, not to look at my watch. I just have to look at it. Cause I don't know how long we've been going. Um, yeah. I think that's, that's kind of it in terms of the time that we have, cause it's eight Oh five. And so I think we just, you know, get out of here like cowboy casual. Well, I want to just say thank you to Kara um, in life and, uh, and in, in, in zoom, you are um, a wonderful conversation partner. Uh, maybe my favorite uh, of all. Um, and to thank um, the center for fiction for uh, hosting this. And I'm sorry that I was not able to be on the East coast at this time. Um, and I wanted to thank um, the Jewish Book Council um, and also to just give a shout out to the, the folks at Scribner. I know some of you are here tonight to my like incredible publicist, Katie Monaghan, to um, my editor, Carol Watson, to my and to my publisher, Nan Graham. Um, and you've just been an author's dream. And um, also to my uh, steadfast, wonderful agent, Meredith Cavell Simonoff. I think that's all the people I want to thank for now. Yeah. Like a, tr like a good book published, former book publicist. You gotta, yeah. I should thank the assistants actually, but I don't think we, I don't, I don't think we have time. So I love you to the assistants. Um, all right, guys. Well, thank you guys so much. This is, <laughs> I feel like we were just on Zoom. I know. There's no audience. It's, it's a disembodied fantasy. audience. I have a fantasy of a bunch of sort of clean shaven people out there. Um, thank you, Melissa. You've written a beautiful book. Um, you're an exceptionally gifted writer. And, you know, buy Death Valley. Get, get, buy Death Valley right now and buy it for everybody else. Um, and thank you for, you know, being who you are. So bye. Good night, everybody. Good night. Should we oh, go? Oh, I have to.